have had a good week, would you say? Yeah. Had some good meetings with an evangelist, and now you're coming, you've got to listen to me. We did have a, a real blessing in seeing Matthew Hubbard come to Christ yes. and, uh, last night, and we had the joy, as did Arnold and Judy, of having one of their grandchildren come to Christ. Daniel trusted Jesus last night up in Eden. So it's been a good work when we, a good week when we see the response to our Lord's calling like that. And I had an opportunity to share some time with the doctors yesterday, all afternoon as a matter of fact. And uh, they found some things that we've got to take care of, but all in all, it was a blessing to be able to walk out and continue on. Turn with me tonight to the second chapter of the book of Romans, if you will. And after we pray, I'll do some reading from that. Heavenly Father, we are thankful tonight for those who had an opportunity to trust you this week as Savior. We trust, Father, that they will continue to uh, follow your admonition and draw close to God through the word and uh, Father, go through a discipleship program that will set a pattern for them for the many days of service that they can enjoy uh, at your hand. Father, we uh, rejoice uh, tonight that we can come together and share some time in your word. We pray for those that are not here, Father, not knowing the reasons in all cases, but we do pray for those who are away because of sickness and ask that you're, for your healing and lifting up. For those who simply are discouraged, Father, we pray that you might encourage them as well. We pray for our missionaries. In whatever land you've placed them, Father, uh, encourage them, give them the needs of their ministry, bring souls to their attention that they can lead them to Christ, and we'll thank you for what you're going to accomplish through them. I pray that you'll be with me now as I lead this lesson tonight, that it might be meaningful, that those present would open their hearts and minds to what your word has to say. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. In the second chapter of Romans, we're going to read down through, oh, perhaps 10 verses or so, 10 or 12 verses. So if you'll stand as we honor God's word tonight. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also for the, to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Take a seat, please. We've looked at chapter 1 on a couple or three occasions here, and we see rather clearly and convincingly that uh, the heathen man is lost and without excuse before God, Romans 1, 17 to 32. And now in the first part of this chapter 2, he'll show us that the moral man is lost and without excuse. And later on in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, he'll He'll show us that the religious man, the Jew, is lost and without excuse. There's a key word in uh, the first few verses of this chapter that I want to examine tonight uh, here in chapter 2. Uh, 
it's a word judge or judgment. Uh, you can look in verses 1, 2, 3, 5, 12, and 16 and see that, verse, that word used or derivation of it. In verse 1, we have a man sitting in judgment. And, uh, but starting in verse 2, we have God on the throne of judgment, which is the way it ought to be. That's a proper and right way. God is the perfect and righteous judge. And in these first 16 verses, we didn't read all of them, but in the first 16 verses, we'll discover several principles of judgment. And these principles will help us to understand what kind of judge God is and how he carries out and exercises his judgment. Principle of judgment number one, the moral man is considered inexcusable, is rendered inexcusable before God the righteous judge. In reading Romans 2.1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Inexcusable, uh, of course, means that there is no defense. You can go back to Romans 1.20 and see that at the bottom of the end of that verse it says, so that they are without excuse. Man has nothing to say. He's silenced. Uh, he is guilty uh, and he knows it. Uh, this verse uh, here, two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, is talking about a person who is passing judgment on another condemning the actions of, of someone else. So he's talking about the moral person, that individual that has moral discernment, uh, the person who passes uh, moral judgment on uh, another person. Um, there's a difference between the moral man and the heathen man. In Romans 1, 20, uh, 32, the heathen man, if you want to look back at that, the heathen man approves and applauds the sinful conduct. But here in Romans 2.1, the moral man disapproves and judges sinful conduct. The moral man condemns another for sinful conduct, but since he himself is guilty, uh, he's really uh, being guilty of the same thing that he's accusing another of. He is, in effect, condemning himself. Um, that principle can be illustrated throughout Scripture in several places, but I've chosen a, a couple of them. If you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter 12, and follow along with verses 1 through 9. Um, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, if you went back to the previous chapter, you'd find uh, the context for all of that. David had committed adultery, he and Bathsheba. Uh, 
looking back to verses 5 and 6. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Did David pass judgment on someone there? Certainly he did. What was he doing in making that judgment? He condemned himself, didn't he not? Was David forced to acknowledge his guilt? Verse 13, I think you'll find he did. And then we have an account in John, chapter 8, 1 through 11. Won't take time to turn there tonight, but this is a situation where the scribes and the Pharisees were accusing the woman of having been taken in adultery. And the Jews passed judgment on a guilty woman, but they soon learned that she alone was not guilty. These religious and moral men had to walk away with nothing to say. The principle? The reason that we so easily recognize sin in others is because we're so used to it ourselves. And when we point the accusing finger at someone, you've all heard this old adage that there are three pointing back at us. And then looking at, chap at uh, Romans 2, 2, we find the second principle of judgment, that God's judgment is according to truth. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. We are sure, it says there. That is to say, we know. We are aware. If you watch television at all today, uh, you'll know that there were several instances where judges were uh, shown issuing verdicts and issuing commentary about various things that are happening across our land. But a human judge is limited when it comes to knowing the truth and ascertaining the true facts of any case. A judge, a human judge, has to depend upon the testimony of men, many of whom we know will often lie under oath. People may fail to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But that's no problem with God. The true facts of every case are naked and open before him, as we read in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. God doesn't need witnesses. God doesn't need a jury, because he personally has witnessed every instance of crime, activity of evil nature, and every sin that has ever been committed. And he knows all the facts. He never, ever misrepresents a person's case. And we can be sure that God's judgment is always according to the truth. And on down to, chat, to verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Which brings us to principle number 3, that God's judgment is inescapable. The answer to the question of this verse is obvious. No, there isn't any escape. If anybody thinks that they will escape the judgment of God, then they're thinking wrong. There's no such thing as the perfect crime, because men, while they may escape human justice, they'll never escape divine justice. Turn with me to the book of Amos, chapter 9. It says in verse 1 and following, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence, and though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. 
There's no getting away from God. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Principle number four man should not run away from God. Escape is impossible. But they should run to God. Repentance is essential. And God uses a few words there, like goodness which, of course, is kindness, generosity. And we know that God's goodness extends to all men. Uh, Matthew 5.45 is one verse you might look to support that. Then we have the word forbearance, which is related to holding back. God holds back his judgment. God delays his judgment. He doesn't always judge sin immediately. Sometimes he does, but sometimes he doesn't. Long-suffering. Aren't you glad that God is long-suffering? I certainly am. Uh, Incidentally, it isn't incidental, but I celebrated my 40th anniversary this week of my rebirth, being born again. And uh, Tuesday night, Monday night rather, And I'm certainly thankful that God is long-suffering toward me and allowed me that time to make a decision. But though God is long-suffering and slow to anger, he does sometimes get angry. But his long-suffering won't last forever. The fact that God is good and forbearing and long-suffering ought to lead men to repentance. Men ought to run to God seeking his mercy. But instead of that, uh, men despise God. They harden their hearts and they refuse to repent. And today, during this age of grace, God's goodness and grace and mercy abounds. God's goodness and grace abounds toward all men. But men still refuse. To repent. In the tribulation period, God's severe judgment and plagues will abound toward all men, but men will still refuse to repent. But when a sinner does repent, whether now or then, there's great joy in heaven, as there was this week, and there is every time someone comes to Christ. And now looking at uh, verse 5. We read, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness, the righteous judgment of God. The principle there is that there will be a final day of judgment for the ungodly. And this day of judgment is described as a day of wrath and revelation. Uh, Revelation meaning the unveiling of the righteous judgment of God. This final day of judgment for the ungodly is also described for us in 2 Peter 3 7, where it speaks of the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And then God uses some words again in his word here. He talks about the hardness of the hearts of men. They get harder and harder as they refuse to respond to God's goodness and forbearance and long suffering. And then the impenitent, which describes a person who refuses to repent. And uh, there we can use the example of the two uh, uh, criminals on the crosses next to Christ when he was crucified. Uh, One was penitent, that is to say he was repentant, and the other one wasn't. Uh, And then God's word says, treasurest up. Or treasure us up unto for thy self worth or wrath. Treasuring up wrath, the miseries of wrath. Instead of laying up treasures for heaven, Matthew six, nineteen and twenty. They were treasuring up wrath from heaven, were storing it up for that final day. Principle number six. 
It's called the righteous judgment of God. God's judgment is perfectly righteous. God, the righteous judge, makes no mistakes. You can look back at Genesis 18.25 or Romans 9.14. When the divine judge reaches a verdict, it must be right. The penalty or the punishment must be right as well. And it always is because God, again, doesn't make mistakes. The judge of all the earth is going to do right every time. Then verse 6 says, who will render to every man according to his deeds. God's judgment is just. Every man will get exactly what he deserves. God will render or give back to everyone, to each man, according to his deeds or his works. And here we have the perfect justice at work. God evaluates a man's work and judges accordingly. The penalty will perfectly fit the crime every single time. Every man will get his due reward, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And there are a lot of passages in the scripture that I won't relate to you tonight that speak of that very thing. And then we see that uh, uh, man will be judged and be punished. But according to grace, sin can be pardoned and forgiven. Turn with me to Psalm 103. It says in Psalm 103, verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. And then uh, look down to verse 10. He that he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Verse 10 is only true because of the grace of God. The wonderful truth of the gospel is that God can be gracious to sinful men without compromising his justice. The Lord Jesus died for our sins, and so God has dealt with Christ after our sins, and God has rewarded Christ according to our iniquities, as we see there in verse 10. God remains just because he poured out his wrath that we deserved on Christ. And at the same time, he's also able to graciously justify the sinner who trusts in his son. Romans 3.26, we'll not turn there, but aren't you glad tonight that you don't have to bear the penalty for your sins? I certainly am. Sometimes we use that definition of justification. We justified. I get a little tired of hearing that expression, just as if I never sinned when applied to the righteousness which we have through Christ. Because we're not, you know, that, that de in my mind, that demeans Christ to say that we are just as if we never sinned. Christ is the only one that never sinned. We put on his righteousness, and that's the way God sees us, through the righteousness of Christ. But to say that we are justified because we never sinned is something that I find difficulty uh, getting a hold of. I know Christ did go to the cross for me, uh, and he's... I bear his righteousness as God sees me, but what do you think about that? And maybe we can discuss it some other time, but let's look to Romans 7 through 10 now in verse uh, chapter 2. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile but glory honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile principle number eight 
God punishes those who do evil and rewards those who do good. And we see here in the structure of these verses something that is called inverted parallelism. Verse 7, if you look at that, this is how God will reward those who do good. And then verse 8, this is how God will reward those who do evil. Verse 9, this is how God will reward, reward those who do evil. And verse 10, this is how God will reward those who do good. So I'm going to stop there tonight with principle number 8. And next week we'll pick up with our study of Romans again in, uh, in chapter 2. So if you have prayer requests, we'll hear them now.